now it's time to open the Holiday Booms pattern and start to cut the fabric. So it starts on the bottom of page one and then carries over onto page two. So I start with my white fabric and reading the directions. I'm gonna cut my white fabric so that I have an 11 by 11 inch square for the, my top fabric of my center flower. And then four five and a half by 11 inch border pieces. Then I move on to my green fabric to have an 11 by 11 inch square as the background fabric of my center flower. And four, five and a half by five and a half inch squares as the top fabric for the flower corner posts. Then out of my red fat quarter, I'm going to cut four, five and a half by five and a half inch squares as the background fabric of my flower corner posts. Then my yellow is a full quarter yard and out of that, I'm going to cut two three quarter inch by 11 inch inner border strips for my center flower. And I'm going to cut four three quarter inch by five and a half inch inner border strips for my corner posts. And then I'm going to cut two three quarter inch by 21 and a half inch inner border strips and I'm going to cut two complete with the fabric by two inch strips for my binding strips. I have them folded in half just so they don't get tangled. And then I'm gonna make sure I have a piece of scrap that I can use as my applique bits for my flower centers. And we'll be back. Um, I'm sorry, I almost forgot my fusible. I'm going to then cut out my fusible. I'm going to make a 10 and a half inch by 10 and a half inch piece of fusible for tracing my center flower. And then I'm going to cut out four, five and a half inch, excuse me, five inch. I always cut my fusible the thinnest size of my block. So I'm gonna cut four, five inch pieces of fusible for my corner posts. And I'm gonna have another piece of um, fusible for cutting out my flower centers for all of my um, flowers. So now we'll come back and we'll get going on actually starting to make our reverse applique blocks. So Margaret Willingham here, and I'm ready to get started to work on my reverse applique for our Holiday Blooms pattern. So we're gonna reverse applique this center flower block, and then we're gonna also reverse applique our four corner post blocks. So the first thing we need to do is to trace the center design. So I've got my piece of fusible, and it's cut to four and a half, uh, 10 and a half by 10 and a half, and I'm gonna fold it so that I find my quarter marks and I'm gonna lay it on top of my pattern, and I've got four hash marks on the pattern mark, the pattern, and I'm gonna line up my quarter marks with my hash marks. This will keep my design centered. And I'm going to pin my pattern, my fusible, to my pattern so it won't shift as I'm tracing. I'm gonna use my mechanical pencil and I'm gonna trace the design. I'm gonna trace right on the edges of the black and gray shapes. So on the pattern, most of the shapes are black and that denotes what's gonna be reverse applique. The very center circle is dark gray because that's actually going to be applique on top after I've done the reverse applique. So it's just gonna remind me of that. 
but at this stage I'm going to draw around everything, the outlines of everything. So I use a mechanical pencil. You can also use a number two pencil, but I find a mechanical pencil keeps a sharper tip so I can be more accurate. And if it breaks, you know, I've, I can just click it and I've got a nice sharp tip again. So this is a 0.7 millimeter lead on it. So I'm not gonna trace all of that. You don't need to watch me trace the entire design but because I already have, voila, I have the whole design trace already here on this one. So once I've got the whole design trace on the fusible, I would take it off the pattern. The next thing I would do is I take my white 11 inch square of top fabric. Now I'm gonna do the same concept that I did with the fusible. I'm gonna fold it to find my quarters of my top fabric. And I'm just gonna use my thumb to press in my seams, my quarter marks. You can iron it if you'd like. And then I open it up and I'm gonna lay it down so that my right side is facing down on my table. Now with most batiks, which I'm using, it doesn't really matter because sometimes, anyway, sometimes you like the wrong side better, but there's usually one side that you can see the design a little bit more strongly on. So you can also go to the corners and you can pull and the fabric will bow point to the right side. So this is the right side, so I'm gonna flip it over. Now I'm gonna take my fusible and lay it onto the wrong side of my top fabric. And see, I'm lining up the quarter marks, my folds of the fusible with the folds of my back, my top fabric there. And then I would iron. Now I already have a piece ironed so you can see what it looks like. So it's ironed on. Then I would come in with my very sharp scissors. I like my Kai bent handled sharp tip scissors because I can poke right in on the design line and cut them out. And if I cut them out very, very carefully, I can actually save those shapes that I cut out and I can make an applique version of the same block. So if you like to use absolutely everything, you can do that. So I have a block of this already cut out. See there, it's already cut out. So when I've cut it out, then I have a piece of what I call fabric Swiss cheese. It's very holy. All right. So then I would peel the paper off and I would line up the edges and I would iron it onto the right side of my green background fabric. And we begin to see that design peek out, which is what makes it reverse applique. So there we have that all peeled off. And here I have it already ironed and fused together. So the next thing I would do is I would go to my, at this stage, I would treat it with Material Magic Spray-On Stabilizer. This is a great product. I can spray it on and it turns my fabric very stiff so it's not gonna get sucked into my sewing machine when I do my satin stitch and then it washes out when it's all done and it doesn't discolor the fabric. Um, and then as I say, it washes away when I'm all done. So it keeps it nice and stable. Otherwise you would need an add-in stabilizer. You can use whatever you like. I'm not an expert in what you would want to use, um, but you would want a light to a medium. Um, you would just have to, it depends on your machine and what it does. So this is a um, another piece of, it, of the top two fabrics layered together and fused. And I've begun the satin stitch on it. When I zoom in, you can see it, but I've left some of it undone over here so that I can begin to show you how I do my satin stitch. And I'm gonna to go to my machine next so I can show you that. So I'll catch up with you in just a second on that. Now I would follow the same steps of tracing and fusing that I did with the top fabric. I'm gonna zoom out. If you get seasick, close your eyes for a second. There you go. 
I would do exactly the same steps with my corner posts. I would fold my fusible to find my quarter, my quarter marks. I would lay it on top of my pattern. I would trace the design. I would fold my green top fabric, find my quarter marks of that. It's very tiny, but I would do it. And then I would line it up, lay it down, fuse it on, cut it out, iron it on, treat it with material magic, so that I'm ready to do the satin stitch on those as well. Now, when I'm doing my flower centers, I would do similar concept. I would take my little piece of fusible, I would go around and I would reposition and I would trace. I need five flower centers and I can just move it around until I get all five of those centers. And then I would iron the fusible onto my yellow so that I've got it and then I would cut each of those out. Now, I don't cut those out until right when I'm ready to iron them onto my block after I've done my reverse applique stitching because I don't want to lose all those little circles. So I would wait until right before I'm going to fuse it on. So I'll catch you up at my sewing machine in just a minute. So I'm working on the machine reverse applique of the center flower block for our holiday blooms. So I've already done the satin stitch of the machine reverse applique of the center center of the block. And typically on a larger piece or a bigger block, I would start in the center and work my way out. Sometimes on a smaller piece like the corner post, it really doesn't matter too much because there's not going to be a lot of um, puckering in and growing smaller. But, you know, I would always follow the principle of going from the middle and working my way out, just in case. And the Tyrell Magic Stabilizer also stabilizes it enough that also that minimizes that kind of sucking in. So um, I've been doing a uh, two width and a 0.4 millimeter um, uh, stitch length on this one. Sometimes I use a narrower 1.5 width it is easier, particularly if it's a beginning project for you, to use a wider width just to cover that raw edge. Now, most people are used to doing applique, so you're used to thinking about covering the raw edges of this shape. So you're used to having more of your stitch on the size of the piece. Well, in reverse applique, this is your raw edge right here, and you're going to do more of your stitch work on the top fabric out here. So it's a little bit um, different to switch your mindset around. So I sight in my satin stitch with the left side of my needle, right here hugging that raw edge, but the left needle is in the background fabric. So it's gonna be in the green, hugging the raw edge, and the right side of the satin stitch is going to be in the top fabric here. So this is where the width of my satin stitch is going to be. Now, if you sight the other way, that's fine. There's no magic to how I do it. It's just how I do it. And I just want you to be aware of that when I'm talking about how I'm counting my stitches beyond or where I'm putting my needle. So if you are someone who's going to sight with your right needle into the background fabric hugging the raw edge and your left side of the satin stitch in the top fabric, you're just going to have to switch the lefts and the rights around. So just be aware of that. Now I'm using Floriani embroidery thread as my thread. I just like the little bit of sheen that it gives to um, the look. And I'm matching my thread color with my top fabric, not the background. So that's also a little bit different. People often look at it and they think that they're like in applique, you would match the color of the shape that you see. In reverse applique, you're matching the thread color to the top fabric that you see. So it also gives a little bit different look. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to um, machine reverse applique around this shape and then we'll come to this big shape here. So I'm going to drop my needle. It's in the left side of my satin stitch. I know that because of where I ended off and I'm going to zoom in so that you can see a little bit better. 
and I'm going to drop my presser foot. I sew needle down and my presser foot can hover on this machine. It's a feature I like very much. So I start with like two stitches and then I'm going to bring the tail of my thread around and I'm going to bury it in my satin stitches I sew. Now I first have an inside curve here. And any time I'm going to stop on an inside curve, I'm going to make sure the needle is in the right-hand side of the stitch so that if I move it too much by mistake, I'm not going to end up with a gap. And you can go as fast or as slow as you need to get the stitch work you want. Now I'm coming up to an acute inside point which means I'm going to stitch beyond my point. And I'm going to count, I need to stitch beyond the number of stitches that will match the width. Three, four. I figured out that I need to go about four stitches beyond. And I'm going to pivot so the back of my presser foot is parallel to the leg of stitches that I just did. I'm going to do half a stitch so it puts my needle in the left side of my satin stitch. And then I'm going to turn so my presser foot and the direction that I'm sewing is parallel to where I'm going next. And then I can sew straight forward and you can see how the left side of my needle is exactly into the background fabric parallel or right next to that raw edge. You're always trying to keep your satin stitch perpendicular to that raw edge. Now here at the end of it, I also have an acute inside corner or point, and I'm going to stitch beyond one, two, three, four, and I end in the right, pivot my piece, get the needle on the left side of the stitch, pivot again so I'm parallel to where I'm going. And the back of the, excuse me, the back of my presser foot is parallel to where I've been and I'm perpendicular to where I'm going next. Sorry, I'm sewing in saying words like parallel and perpendicular. I can sometimes get tongue-tied. And I stitch forward a little bit to overlap where I stitch. I like to end in the left so I'm set for when I start again. And then I'm going to back tack to finish off. And I can cut off my starting tail. It's sewed under. And then we see my shape is all sewed. And because of how I did my points, I don't have any X's at the ends of my points or the beginnings of my point. Now this shape has a lot going on in it. You've got lots of outside curves, inside curves, lots of little things going on. So let's look at how we do this. There's gonna be a lot of stops and starts and a lot of little things that we have to do to keep it going. So I'm gonna start in my point I'm a point starter. I freak a lot of people out when I tell them that. But it's what works for me. You don't have to do it this way. It's just what works for me. So I brought my tail around and I buried it. So I'm constantly moving my piece a little bit. do a little bit more adjustment. So because this is an outside curve, I'm going to stop every time with my needle in the left in the background fabric, just little adjustments. And I'm going to get rid of that tail because it's starting to distract me. But if I stop with my needle in the left in that outside curve, then I won't get any gaps. So when I stitch, the crossover of the stitches on the white fabric will keep it covered. So I won't have any gaps. And it's just little turns. So sometimes I'm doing only two or three stitches before I stop and start.
So this is the fussiest part of this whole center block. Now it's all of a sudden shifting to an inside curve. So now every time I stop, my needle is going to be in the right hand side in the top fabric. change of direction again so now it's an outside curve It's all of a sudden shifting again. You can hear how my machine changes the sound based upon the speed that I'm going, when I'm speeding up, when I'm slowing down, based upon how fussy a curve may be. little small adjustments I'm gonna open up a little bit They're over in the fussy corner get used to it and you'll get the, used to the feel of when you need to stop and position. Is your material moving smoothly or is it starting to get caught in the feed dogs a little bit and then it's really smarter to just kind of stop and reposition everything and let the material soften a little bit and relax.
here we have an acute inside point again. This is actually so cute, it needs like five stitches to go beyond. Stitch parallel to it. I'm just going to get to the end of this very sharp curve. It actually is a little curve. left every time in this curve. And then I'm just going to swing it over so you can just see what we've done. So let's see if we can get, I'm going to zoom in so you can just see a little bit more. So that's how we did that half of it and you would just keep that concept going to do the other half of this shape. So, and now I'm going to zoom out. So if you get dizzy, close your eyes a second. I'll tell you when to open. Close your eyes. All right. And so here I can show you some of the other, of those shapes in the other corners. You can open your eyes. And there we see the other corners of that whole shape going around. So, and that's how you want to do it. Just take your time on them. And thank goodness there's only four, right? So you just got to be a little bit fussy, and there's only one block in the center of this uh, cute little piece, our holiday balloon. And then I'll... So now I'm going to go to the middle of my shape and stitch. Now I'm a corner starter. I freak some people out when they know I'm a corner starter. So you'll just have to see what works for you. It really doesn't matter whether you are or not. It's just what works for me. Get my tail so I can stitch it and bury it in my stitch work. So now this is a little inside and outside corner. So I just end right in the left position, right at the corner, pivot. So again, my stitch work covers what I've just stitched. Out. these need to go three beyond so you'll just have to figure out based upon how wide your um, satin stitch is as to how many stitches beyond you will stitch but any inside corner or point you're going to stitch beyond and end in the right and then do that little pivot to go forward again and pivot uh, moving your piece around so that you're keeping your satin stitch perpendicular to your raw edge. It just takes a little practice, but it's worth it. So it doesn't have to be a crapshoot as to whether your satin stitch works. Now I'm on an outside point, so I end in the left position of my satin stitch right at the point, and then I stitch forward. So your stitches cross over where you just stitched, have another outside point and right at it on the left hand side and then stitch forward. And you'll get the hang of it. Because my piece is treated with material magic, it's not going to pucker so much in my piece. One, two, three, ending on the right, pivot, do my little extra bump, and then going forward. And you can see how that left needle just falls right into the background fabric, right along the raw edge, when I get it lined up just right.
coming up to that outside point. So I'm going to end in the left, right at the point. Pivot my piece. Stitch forward. I have another outside point, so I'm gonna end right at the point in the left of my satin stitch. Pivot the piece. Stitch forward. At the left side of the needle, hugging that raw edge right into the background fabric. You just wanna make sure that raw edge is covered. And you want it as close to that raw edge as you can so you keep the open shape of the design. If I have to stop like I am now because it's an inside uh, curve, I'm gonna just make sure my needle is in the right side so I don't get any gaps. Two, three, so I'm constantly counting in my head. I'm at those inside points. I count the stitches in my head. And left, because it's an outside point. left because it's another outside point and if you sight the other way so that your right side of your satin stitch is in the background fabric then just switch your lefts and rights there's no magic to how I sight it and how I stitch it that's just how I do it so don't you know don't think that you have to sight it the way I do it's just what works for me you have to figure out what works for you So I'm beyond one, two, three. overlap my stitches of where I started just a little bit ending in my left position and finish it off my curve my stitches and so there I've got that center motif done and I would continue around doing the other three petals so that I would have them all done and it would end up looking like this. I'm gonna, whoops, it went the wrong way, zoom out. So it would end up looking like that. And then I'm gonna come in with my yellow center, peel the paper off, and, and then I would iron that on and then applique it on with my yellow Floriani thread. I like to keep my threads consistent. So that's how I would do that one. Once you've done all the reverse applique, then it's time to applique on the center flower center. So I've got it ironed on, and now I'm ready to do my applique. And then I've just got, I'm someone who tends to sight with my needle in the right position into the background fabric. I'm gonna try and bring my tail around and bury it. So now I'm gonna circle the other way with my needle into the background fabric. But the principle is the same. I'm trying to keep my stitches perpendicular to that raw edge. But now my right needle is going into the background fabric, which is my top. Every time I'm stopping, I'm leaving my needle in the right position. I'm gonna circle a small, I'm not someone that can go continuously. When it's a larger circle, I tend to be able to 
just stitch continuously and let my hands just move, but when it's small, I tend to do a stop and start method. So it's figuring out little increments of moving my hands and moving the piece, at least if I want it to look reasonably good. And you just have to figure out what works for you. tend to overlap where I started a little bit. Because I'm going to be doing more applique, I'm going to end in the right so that I'm set for where I start. There we go. And we are done. I would trim my threads, but I've appliqued on the center of my uh, center of my holiday blooms block, my flower center block. Trim my threads. So that's how we do it. Thanks. So my center flower block is the flower centers are all applique on and now I just need to applique on the flower centers for my corner posts. So I'm almost done with that. So I'm gonna start the same way. I'm sighting in the right side with the satin stitch with my needle of my satin stitch. It's going into the right side of my block. I'm gonna bring my tail over and bury it. Always leaving my needle in the right hand side in the top fabric. And that background fabric when I'm gonna stop and reposition.
towards there, and the last one is done. Yay, now we're ready. So here we have our flower center block all done. All the reverse applique is done, and the center is applique on. Now, one of the other fun things about doing reverse applique is although most of the time we match our thread color with our top fabric, we do have the option to play with thread color. So on this one, I played with doing red as my thread color for around my flower here to accent the fact that it's a poinsettia. Now I haven't actually done yet the stitch work on these outside pieces and I was going to do it white like I did on the other so I was going to match my top fabric but I could actually do that in green if I wanted to make it feel more like leaves but that would be a choice that I could make or I could do the whole, all the stitch work in red. So just open up the possibilities of doing um, different thread colors as a way of playing with the design. And then I have my um, uh, corner post blocks done as well. So now I'm ready to start constructing my top. I'm ready to begin to assemble my holiday blooms top. So I'm going to sew my corner post, my flower corner post, to the five and a half inch by three quarter inch inner border strip, to a five and a half inch by 11 inch border strip, to a five and a half inch by three quarter inch inner border strip, to a flower corner post. And so I've switched to out of my zigzag stitch, which was what I used for my satin stitch, and I'm doing my straight stitch, and I've got it to do an automatic back tack at the beginning of the end, an automatic cutoff. Those are features of my sewing machine. I've switched out my um, open-toed foot and I've gone to my regular quarter-inch presser foot. Now, I do not use a presser foot that has the guide on the side. Um, I just learned how to sew just using a regular presser foot, so that's what I'm using. I've got my first strip pinned onto my block, so I start with my pedal corner post, and I'm going to begin to sew. So I'm gonna drop my presser foot. And I'm going to sew back tacking. Take my pin out. So I'm just lining up the edge of my quarter inch presser foot with the raw edge of my fabric. And because I don't use the presser foot that has the guide on the side, Generally, as long as I have pinned perpendicular to my raw edge, I can sew over my pins. Um, most sewing machines you can, although they really kind of recommend you take them out. I kind of go back and forth as to what I do. Sometimes when I have just little short um, strips like these, I don't pin at all. I just leave that up to you. To be really secure, you should pin. And now I'm going to back tack at the end. So I finished that off. I'm going to cut my tail from the beginning. Oops, I'm using my scissors upside down. And I'm just going to kind of finger press that open so I can just sit and sew and I'll iron when I'm all done at the end. Now because this is such a little um, piece of fabric that is left there. I am going to go ahead and pin this next one, just it's going to make it more secure. So I'm now sewing on my five and a half inch by 11 inch border piece to my inner border strip. So we're working on our top border of our holiday blooms pattern. And we're sewing with right sides together. And I match up my ends first. And then I'm going to align my middle. I'm not finding perfectly my middle. Drop my presser foot again. And 
so. my next inner border strip. On to the other end, aligning right sides together. together. Again, I match my corners first. seam there and so I have whoops wrong direction sorry about that so I have my first strip my top border all sewed together so now I'm going to go to my ironing surface so now it's time to iron my seams from sewing so on the direction say to iron the seams of your um, inner border strips towards your petal corner posts so I'm gonna iron all my seams right out towards the petal corner posts. Being a little stubborn right now. Well, it probably doesn't matter so much. But you generally want to iron them towards your darker fabrics so that then you don't get shadowing from the front side. This one's going to be a little bit easier, I can see. I'm going to try and get this first one out first, and then we'll iron this second one out. Then I usually come to the front side and Give it an extra pressing as well. Now that row one is constructed, I can sew it to row two which is my three quarter inch by 21 and a half inch inner border. I have my three quarter inch by 21 and a half inch inner border all pinned to 
my top border and I'm ready to sew. As I go over where I have my seams for my inner border, I'm gonna make sure that my seam allowance is underneath our laying flat in the way that I iron them. And then I'm gonna to go to my ironing surface and iron down. So as I add each row, I'm gonna iron. And then when I add my third border, which is um, my borders with my center flower block, I'm gonna actually iron my seams for this inner border towards themselves so they will all lay on top of themselves. I'm ready to sew my third row, which is my border pieces and my inner border strips and then my flower center block, my center flower block. So I've already got my um, 3 quarter inch by 11 inch inner border strip pinned to my border piece. So I'm ready to sew. Lining up my presser foot with the raw edge. fold it open with my thumb so I can just sit and do all my sewing before really doing the final pressing with my iron. I'm going to come in and pin lining up my corners to my center flower block. This side of the block. I pin my other inner border strip.
And finally, my last white border. Press that open a bit, my inner border strip open a bit, so I don't catch too much of what's underneath. So I'm now pinning my last border strip to it. So row three is all stitched, and now it's time to iron the seams that I sewed for my inner border strips, and your directions say to iron them towards your inner border strip. So I'm going to flip over to the back. I'm going to iron first my center here, and I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to iron the seam from this, from the border and the inner border. And then I'm going to fold and just make that seam disappear in that inner border in there. Do the same on the other side. Doesn't really matter which one goes over top and over bottom. This one is naturally kind of going the other way. not going to matter in the grand scheme of things. It's all going to be in the back and the batting. So I'm going to come over to the front side and give it a good pressing again. All right, so my my third border is all pressed. Now I'm going to be pinning my first, my top border and that already has a inner border onto it to my um, third row, which is the middle of my quilt. And there's one more thing that I need to be paying attention to as I'm doing this, and that's lining up this inner border strip with this inner border strip as I'm pinning. So as I'm laying it down, now if I can eyeball here, I can follow the line of this seam with the line of this edge here. So I want to make sure that I am paying attention to that as I'm pinning. So I want to not only get the raw edges lined up, but I want to line up those inner border seams so that when it's all done, you will see straight lines going through your piece. And I want to do that on both sides of, of my piece, both sides of that block. Because otherwise it's gonna look a little wonky. It would be like an Escher painting or something. You know, if it's off a little, 
you know, the eye won't be too bothered by it. But if it's off a lot, that'll, that'll mess with your head. And it's going to bother some people way more than it's going to bother others. So when I'm pinning this, I would do this laying flat on my sewing table. Like I'm doing it and showing you right now. So if there's any easing to do, I would ease it between some of those anchors. So I would make this an anchor here where this seam is and this an anchor and I would ease in the middle. I would make these anchors and ease in the middle here. I would make these two points anchors and ease in the middle. Now I'm ready to go back over to my sewing machine and sew again. finished sewing that so now I would go back over and I would iron that and I would iron it so that this folds in on my inner border there so that's what it would look like from the front so I'm going to come through and iron now ironing this seams from this inner border and I didn't do such a good job here of making sure that I kept those seams Press open on either side. I'm not someone who's going to pick that out and do it over again. It will be okay. I've learned over my years of experience that that's going to be something that's okay. I don't need to pick it out and do it again. I'm going to flip it over to the front and give it a pressing from the front. So that we have our crossroads here and that's pretty well lined up so that matters and that's good. Now if that were really off that I would pick out and do over. But I think my crossroads on both areas is good. So we're off to a good start on that. So next, the next thing I would do is I'm going to come in and on this bottom, get my iron out of the way so I don't burn my fingers. I'm going to come in and I'm now, it's now time to add the next inner border to the bottom of this. And then we would add the last border to the bottom. And then our piece, our top is done and we're ready to layer with batting and backing. 
So I'm just going to sew both of those and iron without stopping and starting and showing you all the steps because I think you get the same, the right idea. We're going to go through those same steps of sewing them on, ironing in between, sew the next one on, paying attention to lining up my crossroads there. So we've got it and I'll show you back when we've got everything sewed on together. our holiday blooms top is done. Next, it's time to layer with batting and backing. So you'll just want some kind of a, I would use just a plain white. I'm not someone that cares so much about what is on the back, um, but you certainly can choose something that's really extra pretty, but I figure if it's gonna be hanging on a wall or on my table, it depends how you're gonna use it. Um, you just, it doesn't matter what's on the back. Uh, if you're going to spend a lot of time quilting it, then you might want something that's like a white, a plain white. I think that's what I put in the directions. It's just a plain white. And then we uh, chose a, uh, the yellow again for the binding on this one. And then we'll get it to see it all done. Thanks. So my holiday blooms top is all layered with my backing and my batting. And I used a my 501 spray adhesive to layer it. And it's been sitting now for about 24 hours so that I'm ready to actually start my quilting. And usually when it's sitting, that's when I am uh, start marking my quilt top. I'm going to do at least a basic um, come around and I would always do in the ditch of all my um, seams in there. And when you are doing quilting of um, reverse applique, you're going to do a minimum of coming inside your negative reverse applique spaces. So just like in applique, you would come outside of a shape, when reverse applique, you're going to go inside of that space. So it would pull into the batting. Since you've gone to all the work to make your design in that background space, now you want to accent it so it's going to pull into it. And that's part of what's going to give that depth to your reverse applique um, piece when it's all quilted. And it just adds to the beauty of it. And you could then also, if you want it on your, say, your petals here, you could give a center vine, a line to your, a vein to your petal here and here if you so desired. But you want to at least come around and go um, in the ditch right along the edges of your stitch work. And you could come and give some texture to inside, give some extra shapes. You could do a little V in here, something like that. So I have another version here. And because I use green thread, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see it or not. I'm going to zoom in. So if it makes you dizzy, close your eyes for a minute. I'll tell you when I'm zoomed in. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. So here in this shape, I don't know whether you can see it, but I came in and I did a line and then I did a little diamond here, echoing the diamond here. And then I divided the space coming along and echoed around this shape in about an eighth of an inch, coming all the way around, divided it here, and then came and echoed an eighth of an inch here and divided here. So it gives some extra dimension here. Um, this um, little leaf out here, I gave a vein to the middle of it. So you can quilt it in any way that you want. Now on this center, on this one, I gave it just a, about a half inch, three quarters of an inch, traditional cross hatching. And then interiorly here, I did a quarter inch just going through the middle there, not a, truly a cross hatching, but straight lines going through. But then when I came, I'm gonna zoom out. So close your eyes a second, I'll tell you when to open. <clears throat> when I came out to the borders, I used this stencil, which is a holly. Now it's too big for the border, so I just found where it fit. And I used my um, washable, I think it's a Clover or Dritz fine point washable blue pen. And I marked it and then I free motion quilted the space here and I kind of figured out where it needed to be centered and I continued lines out. 
and so I free motion quilt it out here. Whenever I do multiple versions of a design, I rarely repeat. I like to get creative. So on this one, I was playing with some of my other holiday stencils. I'm trying to find what stencil I just drew on. So this is a wreath. Now, obviously, it's too big for anything on here. But if I lay my wreath and I can take the top three leaves and I can layer it on and I can use my blue washable marker and I can do three leaves and it would make a nice little arc and I could do that filling in the space around my center reverse applique. And so I would still come in and I would do the interior space of each of these green shapes and then I would fill the space outside and then to get these nice, smooth, round circles here, I have another design that has these nice, smooth, round circles. And I just laid them, and I eyeballed, but I lined up my diagonal going across to get it so that it would be this nice, smooth line going across and put three dots in the corner. And I'll do those free motion. And then out in the border, I have this design, and all of these are by different companies. Um, these blue plastic stencils are put out by the stencil company. They have a lot of wonderful stencils. And then this one is put out by um, Full Line Stencil. And I like this poinsettia, and I thought I would try taking, whoops, where did I lay it? I think I laid it this way. And I can pounce it on with their pounce pad and the blue pounce pad. And I can do two of these poinsettias and I can fill the border. And if I flip it this way, then these dots will be the connection coming into the poinsettia on the other side. And I can do two quilted poinsettias in this border. So that's what my plan is for this one. So it's always just fun to create something different if you're gonna make a piece twice. So we'll see how it works when I'm all done. Happy quilting. And for the final look at Holiday Blooms, all done with its binding and it's washed with all the markings gone. And with that beautiful pucker that happens after it's washed so you can really see the beauty of the quilting. depth and dimension that's created with the reverse applique receding. So our red poinsettias in the corner posts. Quilting around the center. And the green poinsettia receding into the white. And pull out to get the overall look. holiday blooms for sitting on your table or for hanging on your wall. <laughs>